going to ask you to go ahead and remain seated for this responsive reading of Psalm 23 as our call to worship. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Leads me beside still waters, restores my life. Leads me in the right paths for the sake of the Lord's name. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup of Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Amen. We're going to turn the lights down and I'm going to lead us in um, a meditation. Hard things happen. We suffer losses. It feels like this. It takes us to our knees. And when you lose a high school senior, the whole community feels it and suffers. It's a deep, deep loss. The thing about these losses, I'll read it to you because it doesn't come out very well on the screen. You can close your eyes for something you don't want to see, but you can't close your heart for something you don't want to feel. You can't close your heart for something you don't want to feel. And the family who loses a high school senior, or anyone, the family who suffers a sudden loss. For them, it's like getting kicked right out of the stream of life. It's, it's like you're watching uh, the world through eyes that seem like remote cameras, and you're sort of way, way back, way far, and, and you're in that state of shock because of the loss that you don't forget. And when, when you lose somebody from a small community, the whole community is affected. I was at Kai's funeral this week, and I watched from the standing room only part in the narthex of our sister church, Foursquare. I watched the people coming, and I also watched the family leaving. And Kai had a, an interesting family. It was a family with two streams of heritages coming down into one person like our president. And so when the family came out, they looked like 21st century America. They looked like all of us. And there were no dividing walls between people of different traditions. There were no dividing walls whatsoever. They were connected in their grief over a common loss. No distance at all. Does it take that kind of pain to remind us how close we are to each other and how deeply we are connected? It does remind us of that. The community has an opportunity then to wrap arms around the family and the friends and the classmates to come together, to love a little more deeply, to speak a little more tenderly, to, to relate a little more generously to each other, to raise the bar of human behavior to a better place than it finds itself. In Boston this week, 
We had a lot of families that experienced loss. And in the last couple of days, a whole lot more families experienced loss in southwest China as a, 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 an earthquake has, has killed at least 200 people and damaged villages and people's lives deeply. Now, I don't know what you think about the politics of this entertainer, um, but occasionally this particular entertainer is serious. It's rare because he's a comedian. But this week he was serious. He was serious at the beginning of a show. His name is, his name is Stephen Colbert. And at the beginning of the show, he said this about the people of Boston. He said, the people who perpetrated this evil, this sheer evil, think that they're going to destroy the character of America or of Boston. But then he says, no, what you do is you display the character of the country. Because people who had finished running 26 miles in a marathon ran two miles further in order to donate blood at the hospital. Two miles further. Something about evil and tragedy brings the best out of us. Let's listen to Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. People got to remember, Psalm 23 isn't a Pollyanna psalm. It's a psalm that looks at the reality of our existence, evil, death, the shadow, the valley. It takes a good hard look at that and says, but we have a shepherd. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And that's, that's where we walk. When we lose loved ones, when we lose high school seniors, when we lose parents, grandparents, when we lose whoever, we're the ones that are walking in the valley of the shadow of death. And there are ways that we're counseled to be. And reminders. I will fear no evil. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. How can the shepherd do this in the midst of the turmoil and the tragedy and the loss? How can the shepherd do this? But that's what the psalmist claims. That's what the psalmist proclaims. And that's what our lives, when we listen, will be shaped by. Leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. The shepherd restores my soul. Doesn't leave me in the tank. And when you've suffered deep loss, when your life is going upside down, regardless of what the circumstances are, and you feel like everything is topsy-turvy, and you start to go into a dark place, and you begin to lose hope, and there are voices in your head that start taking you and spiraling you down to despair and hopelessness and helplessness, when you start to attend to those voices, let me remind you, they are not the shepherd's voice. And they're not your own true voice. Because the shepherd's voice restores the soul, leads us through the valley of the shadow. So listen for the shepherd's voice. Even on a battlefield, even on a battlefield, there's hope. Look at this, a baptism in a, in a foxhole. Listen to the shepherd's voice. Don't let any other voice drive you down. Listen to the shepherd's voice. And then, Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, was asked, what do you do? What do you tell children when something tragic happens, when these horrible images come across the screen? And Fred said, watch for the helpers. Watch for the helpers. 
the people who, when everybody else is running away from the scene where there's devastation and destruction, are running toward the scene with a courage that's born of the Spirit of God that's residing inside them. Watch for the helpers. Be one of the helpers. Listen to the shepherd's voice. Listen. Then sing. Let's stand and do just that.
together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. seated please and Jim Schmitz is going to bring us a children's message this morning so kids you are welcome to come forward and receive the message and also to collect some pelican food so that we can take care of our mission and ministries helping people around the world so if you see an adult waving some pelican food which looks just like money you come ahead Good morning. Come on down. <laughs> I have two for children's moments. I think I've got more out there. Come on down. And we just lift his mouth up and stick it right in. He'll be glad to eat that. You know? Pick his mouth up like that. There we go. All kinds of money. Good deal. Oh, I see more pelican food back there. Hey, hands up back here. Who wants to go get some? See right back here? Yeah. Go back there and gather it up. <laughs> Hurry. Wow, there's a lot of green stuff. Good salad. Okay, we've got some wonderful young people. I want you young people to turn around this way. Pastor Paul asked me to talk about this carving that's underneath the altar. Who can tell me what that carving is? Okay. It's the tomb. It's the tomb. Can you tell me anything else about it, Carolyn? What does it do? The rock can roll back and forth. Okay. He asked me to talk a little bit about why I made this thing. So while I'm starting to do that process, why don't each one of you come up and roll that thing back and forth a little bit? I'm glad we don't have a lot of people. It won't take us long this time. Okay. So come show the audience how that works. And you know, you can even stick your hand way back in the tomb. What's in the tomb? Two benches where someone could be laid back there after they died. And what is on the one bench? A piece of cloth. And that's what they kind of covered him up with. Because when they, when they killed him on the cross, he didn't have hardly any clothes on. Maybe, maybe not even any clothes. And they wanted to give him some dignity. And so they covered him up. And that was the cloth. But why is the cloth still there? When he rose, he didn't need it anymore. Because he, had, you know, and where, where did he say he was going to go? Where did he tell people, I'm going 
to see my father in heaven. And you know what? His father is your father. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, Our Father who art in heaven. That's my father. That's your father. So we kind of got two fathers, don't we? And that kind of makes us brothers and sisters. That makes me kind of like your brother and your grandpa, doesn't it? <laughs> wow. And, and he was going home. He was homeward bound. Headed to heaven. We have lots of symbols in our church. What's the big symbol for Christian? What? The cross. And what does the cross symbolize? Uh-huh. Jesus died. And what does the open tomb symbolize? He rose from the dead. And we all can rise from the dead and go see our Father in heaven. The, here on the top it says, He lives. He's not dead anymore. He's alive. And he went to heaven to see his Father. And that's a special place. And when I carved this thing, I wanted to do something that symbolizes. It's kind of like, here's the story of him dying. And now for the rest of the story, I'm going to go see my father. I'm homeward bound. And you all can follow me. And he gave us a set of maps, plans, instructions on how to get there. What's that set of plans called in that book? What book do we use a lot in the church? Okay, Carolyn. The Bible is your instructions on how to get there. So symbols are really important in our church. And I kind of like the symbol that this is the rest of the story. And I also like kid-friendly things. So I kind of made it so it's kind of you could actually do something with it because this altar is sort of a symbol, a special place, a focal point in the church where we put our money when we give it. Sometimes we have a Bible setting up here. Sometimes we have special flowers. It's a focal point. It's sort of the center when we want to do communion where we break the bread, all of those kind of things. So it's a special place. So that symbol went in a special place that's sort of the rest of the story for Christians. Okay, let's, yeah, it's open. Let's all get, this time we're going to gather right up here because it's such a small number. Let's just gather right up here and make our little circle. And would you please join us, stand up here and gather hands with one of these girls? Can you come up here and join hands? You don't have to if you don't want to. Okay, all right, all right, let's join hands. And our Father... Thank you, Thank you. For, giving us symbols for giving us symbols and special instructions, and special instructions for, how to follow you. for how to follow you. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Jim. It's a good reminder that this is a hands-on altar, and if there are any big children of any age that would like to move the stone back and forth or come over and touch this altar, this is a hands-on altar, and you're welcome to do that. You can sneak in here after, you know, worship and, or during the week. You're welcome to do that. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, children. We hear a New Testament reading from the book of Acts, and... As Jesus had said, you will do the same things that I do to his disciples before his crucifixion and resurrection. Sure enough, in the book of Acts, we see his disciples um, proclaiming and living the life that cannot be stopped, the life of our risen Savior. So here now, down the road away in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, gazelle in our language. She was well known for doing good and helping out. During the time Peter was in the area, she became sick and died. 
Her friends prepared her body for burial and put her in a cool room. Some of the disciples had heard that Peter was visiting in nearby Lydda and sent two men to ask if he would be so kind as to come over. Peter got right up and went with them. They took him into the room where Tabitha's body was laid out. Her old friends, most of them widows, were in the room mourning. They showed Peter pieces of clothing that Gazelle had made while she was with them. Peter put the widows all out of the room. He knelt and prayed. Then he spoke directly to the body. Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes. When she saw Peter, she sat up. He took her hand and helped her up. Then he called in the believers and widows and presented her to them alive. When this became known all over Joppa, many put their trust in the master. Peter stayed on a long time in Joppa as a guest of Simon the Tanner.
Thank you, Jordan, Janice, Jamie, and choir. The next reading we will take from the last book in our New Testament, from Revelation chapter 7. And this is a scene that stretches human words and human language. The whole book pushes to the limits the capacity of language to carry meaning. The images jump off the page. They're vivid, sometimes scary, and, and challenge the imagination even to keep up. There's so many of them. You need to know that Revelation was written by John of Patmos. He was in exile. He was a prisoner. He had a vision. And the vision was given to him by God to the community. And we still have this vision. And it was particularly given to John of Patmos because his people were undergoing tremendous persecution. They were under pressure. There was bad stuff happening all the time. And this powerful vision carried a message of hope for people who were giving their lives for their faith. Here, the image from John's revelation. I looked again. I saw a huge crowd, too huge to count. This is a vision of heaven. Everyone was there, all nations and tribes, all races and languages, and they were standing. dressed in white robes, waving palm branches, standing before the throne and the Lamb, and heartily singing, Salvation to our God on His throne, salvation to the Lamb. All who were standing around the throne, angels, elders, animals, fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, singing, Oh yes! the blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving to the honor and power and strength to our God forever and ever and ever. Oh, yes. Just then, one of the elders addressed me. Who are these dressed in white robes and where did they come from? Taken aback, I said, Oh, sir, I have no idea but you must know. Then he told me, These are those who come from the great tribulation, and they've washed their robes, scrubbed them clean in the blood of the Lamb. That's why they're standing before God's throne. They serve him day and night in his temple. The one on the throne will pitch his tent there for them. No more hunger. No more thirst, no more scorching heat. The Lamb on the throne will shepherd them, will lead them to spring waters of life, and God will wipe every last tear from their eyes, and God will wipe every last tear from their eyes. The Word of God for the people of God Thanks be to God. Let's begin as we do in prayer. Holy God, we consider deep things this morning. Deep things that were revealed by your Spirit to us through the writer of our text, Revelation. 
Open our minds and our hearts to the power of the message, to the strength of your spirit, to the reality of your presence in our midst. Guide and bless us through these days of trouble and woe and challenge. Help us to remember who you are and who we are and to move forward in hope. To this end, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I wrestled with the title for a while, had a lot of different ones sketched out and tried, but Homeward Bound was really the best title that I could come up with. And of course, the Simon and Garfunkel song for people in my generation is probably leaping into your minds right now. Homeward Bound, I wish I was Homeward Bound. Home where my music's playing. Let's see, is that right? Home where my love lies waiting silently for me, homeward bound. But the phrase from the pen of Paul Simon that played in my mind, even though I selected this title, was one that meant a lot to the generation of soldiers waiting to go home from Vietnam. And it was from a different song, and it went like this. Sail on, silver girl, sail on by. Your time has come to shine. All your dreams are on their way. See how they shine. Oh, if you need a friend, I'm sailing right behind like a bridge over troubled waters. I will ease your mind like a bridge over troubled waters. We find ourselves in troubled waters, needing the bridge, needing the bridge. We journey through this world and again and again and again we hear that this world is not our home. You probably have another song that can leap into your head with those words. This world is not my home. A friend of mine from, from Tennessee used to sing that at the piano. Uh, he was a World War II survivor, a uh, veteran who was shot down in Germany, but he would sing, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. Where is our home and do we get glimpses of home in our lifetime? I think we do. The home is that place where we feel, this is where I'm at peace, this is where I belong, this is where I'm wrapped in love, this is where I'm accepted, this is also where I'm safe. And at times, all the data of our senses and all the input from our media would tell us that we're not safe, it isn't a peaceful place, and would begin to tell us a very different story than our story informs us about. But the people who have undergone deep distress in life, deep loss, and have held on to their faith are the ones that pull through. Have you noticed that? They pull through. I grew up in the atomic age. And since we're talking about revelation, we talk about what happens in the end. What's coming at us? I was a kindergartner, and we were told to climb under our desks and put our hands over our heads to protect ourselves from this. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. I mean, there would, there would be sort of a moment of consciousness and then obliteration. I grew up in Detroit. It was a primary target. 
I mean, it would have been hit. But that was simply the world as I knew it, as I grew up in. And my whole generation, when the older generation hears me talk about this, they go, oh, that's terrible. You shouldn't have had to grow up with that. And I thought, well, no, I, I don't, it didn't bother me. I mean, that's just what it was. Everybody in a generation, we just get used to it. We heard that we were living in the threat of, of nuclear annihilation at any moment, all during the 50s and the 60s. And that race just kept going. And you look at that and you think, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And, and you think about Revelation, which I took a long time to get to when I was reading the Bible. I mean, as I was growing up, I read all the other books. I mean, I just like the other books. But Revelation, I thought, man, that's got some weird stuff in there. I'm not sure I want to, I'm not sure I'm ready for Revelation. But um, in, in Revelation, you know, you think, you hear this about, oh, a lake of fire? Ooh, I'm not, that's, that sounds awful. And so Revelation, you've got this jumble of words and thoughts and ideas. And, and it's, there's so much that comes at you, you don't know quite what to make of it. But the story comes out of deep turmoil, deep distress, tremendous pressure, and violence, and evil. The shadow of death is present for that whole people who experience life when it falls apart. And all of those themes are present in the book of Revelation but the book of Revelation says, remember the story, don't change the story. Remember that God is God. Remember that whatever you see doesn't have the final say. God has the final say, and God holds your life. And Jesus has already displayed, has already told us in the Gospel of John that he came from the Father, which is what, which is what Jim mentioned earlier, came from the Father, and he came to be with us as God present with us, and he was going to lead us back to the Father. So where are we? We are homeward bound. Our true home, our true life, our true identity is not, is not defined by present circumstance or visible, measurable data. There's something more at work in the reality of life. There's the Spirit. And the people of our tradition have said, the Spirit is in a way more real and more eternal than anything that we can cut, measure, put under a microscope, or see. It has a reality that goes beyond our capacity to see. And Revelation reminds us of that. It's a railroad town. You, when we think about images, I, I thought about you, John, when I put this screen up there, because I know you've seen an awful lot of track. You might never have seen one that looked quite like this, but this track is heading off into eternity. And what does eternity look like? Well, I can't make it out real, real strongly, but it looks like it's full of light. It's the road we're on. For Parsons, it's the railroad we're on. Where are we headed? Images. Images of that end time. Images of that home that we're headed to. Images that are spoken of in the dream of Revelation. And the question of, what's heaven like? Well, we know that heaven is going to be at least as good. At, at, at the baseline, it's going to be at least as good as the very best experiences we've had on planet Earth. I mean, if that's the baseline, that's amazing. That it dawned on me when I was running. I was on a five-mile run, much younger, much lighter. <laughs> but I was on, and I had hair. I was on a five-mile run, and, and it was sunset, and it was summertime in Michigan which isn't quite as hot as Kansas, but it was hot and it was humid and there was this breeze. I took my shirt off and there was this breeze and I was watching the sunset and I was running between a couple of farms on Hill Road in Swartz Creek, Michigan. And it was beautiful. It felt beautiful. It looked beautiful. Everything about it was beautiful. And it dawned on me at that point. I said, gosh, heaven is at least as good as this. A shirtless five-mile run on a country road. So we have some images to consider about the home we are bound for. And then I'm going to sing a song. And I want you to think about who you are and whose you are and who we are and what we're called to be.
The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Remember in the Gospel reading or in the Revelation reading, the word they were standing? Who were the people in the white robes that were standing? They were people who had been slain because of their belief. There were people who the last time their friends and their neighbors saw them were laying dead. What does it do to you when you consider the people who are gone now, who you have mourned, are standing and praising God? What does it do to your conviction and your courage? Well, it brings it back. It restores it. It gives you strength. They were standing. And so, standing at the center, another image of of Revelation is the lamb that was slain. Well, who's that? Who's the lamb that was slain? Jesus. And what's Jesus doing? At the center of the cosmos, of everything that is, standing in power and glory alive. Resurrection. And here, this image. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. The Lamb who was slain, the Savior who was crucified, marks on His hand Scars. But what are scars? They are wounds that have healed and give evidence. The dawn. standing on the shore of the dawn of a new day. Our story tells us that Christ is coming. And this next song talks about what that might look like. Is quiet now, the land and the sea. All souls are silent now before the sun. The people gathering, they stand on the shore. The dawn is breaking now, and light appears. Oh, the Prince of Peace has come, has come. He's shining in the sky, the sky. All souls before him bow, they bow. The sun, God is here now. The sun of God is here now. The master of the earth appears. The vision now takes form. Bright robes glowing white, the master's arms outstretched, his throne in sight. All time is over now, the scripture is complete. We meet our maker now, bow at his feet. Oh, the shining star has come, has come. The blessed man of sorrows has returned. 
the Savior of the world is here. No longer must we live in fear. The hand of God has led here. The master of the earth appears. this morn don't tremble before me don't cry you've given your lives for my sake you're my sisters and you'll not die my brothers you'll not die there are others but you Oh, don't tremble, my people, this morn. Don't tremble before me, don't cry. You've given your lives for my sake. You're my brothers, my sisters. You'll not die. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch Him, and say that we love Him. Open our eyes, Lord. Help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. We begin in silent prayer, and after those. Moments we will lift our voices to name names or situations or concerns, and we will respond as I give you, you the lead, Lord, in your mercy, and we all say, Hear our prayers. Let us enter into the spirit of prayer. the people of Parsons, for the people of Boston, 
the people of Waco, the people of Southwest China. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. 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 For the family of Vernon Lewis, Rob Monty's grandpa, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Does, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Dusty Higginson, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For those hurting places deep within us that we cannot speak aloud, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For our soldiers and their families, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue our worship through the sharing of our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings that the work of Christ might continue here and all over the world.
standing as we sing our closing hymn, Lamb of God. storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. 